Translator's Introduction Venerable Atsariya Manpurita Tatera is a towering figure in contemporary Thai Buddhism. He was widely revered and respected during his lifetime for the extraordinary courage and determination he displayed in practicing the ascetic way of life and for his uncompromising strictness in teaching his many disciples. During the fifty years since his death, he has assumed an exalted status in Buddhist circles and thus remains an overshadowing presence whose life and teachings have become synonymous with the Buddha's noble quest for self-transformation. Although Atsariya Man left no written record of his own, this biography, compiled by one of his close disciples some twenty years after his death, is largely responsible for introducing his life, his achievements, and his teachings to a broad section of Buddhist society. Through the widespread popularity of this book, many Thai Buddhists have been given fresh hope that the spiritual liberation which the Buddha proclaimed to the world over 2,500 years ago, and which has been attained by so many aspirants over the succeeding centuries, is still accessible in today's modern age. Many Thais have expressed the view that they had lost confidence that Magga, Palla, and Nibbana were still relevant today, but by reading Atsariya Man's biography, they realized that accounts of these exalted attainments are not mere fragments of ancient history, dead and dry, but a living, luminous legacy of self-transcendence, accessible to any individual who is willing and able to put forth the effort needed to achieve them. They have come to understand that Buddhist monks, with their distinctive robes and monastic vocation, are not merely clerical figures representing the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha. Some of them are indeed living proof of the truth presented in the Buddha's teaching. The noble aim of spiritual liberation must be accomplished by the appropriate means, the middle way, as taught by the Lord Buddha. Although the Buddha forbade the use of self-mortification as a means to gain enlightenment, he nevertheless authorized and encouraged those specialized ascetic practices, known as tutangas, that harmonize effectively with this noble effort. The true middle way is not the smooth path of least resistance negotiated with easy compromises and happy mediums, but rather it is that path of practice which most effectively counters the mental defilements that impede progress by resisting the aspirant every step of the way. The spiritual path is often arduous, being full of hardship and discomfort, while the inner forces opposed to success are formidable and even intimidating. Thus the work of the spiritual warrior requires potent countermeasures to subvert the inertial powers of laziness, craving, pride, and self-importance. So the Buddha encouraged monks who were truly keen on extricating their hearts from the subtlest manifestations of these insidious defilements to practice the Tutangas. Such ascetic observances are specifically designed to promote simplicity, humility, self-restraint, vigilance, and introspection in a monk's everyday life, and the Buddha was known to praise those monks who undertook their practice. For this reason, the lifestyle of a Buddhist monk is founded on the ideal of life as a homeless wanderer, who, having renounced the world and gone forth from the household, dresses in robes made from discarded cloth, depends on alms for a living, and takes the forest as his dwelling place. This ideal of the wandering forest monk intent on the Buddha's traditional spiritual quest is epitomized by the Dutanga Gammatana way of life. Like Dutanga, Gammatana is a term designating a specific orientation shared by Buddhist monks who are dedicated to maintaining an austere meditative lifestyle. Gammatana, literally the basis of work, denotes an approach to meditation practice that is directed toward uprooting every aspect of greed, hatred, and delusion from the heart, and thus demolishing all bridges linking the mind to the cycle of repeated birth and death. Gammatana, with its emphasis on meditative development, and Dutanga, with its emphasis on the ascetic way of life conducive to intensive meditation, complement each other perfectly in the noble effort to transcend the cycle of rebirth. They along with the code of monastic discipline, are the cornerstones on which the edifice of a monk's practice is erected. Both the letter and the spirit of this ascetic life of meditation can be found embodied in the life and teaching of Atsariya Man. From the day he first ordained until the day he passed away, his entire way of life, and the example he set for his disciples, were modeled on the principles incorporated in these practices. 
He is credited with reviving, revitalizing, and eventually popularizing the Dutanga Gambatana tradition in Thailand. Through his lifelong efforts, Dutanga monks, or Gambatana monks, the two are used interchangeably, and the mode of practice they espouse became, and still remain, a prominent feature of the Buddhist landscape there. Atariyaman was especially gifted as a motivator and teacher. Many of the monks who trained directly under his tutelage have distinguished themselves by their spiritual achievements, becoming well-known teachers in their own right. They have passed on his distinctive teaching methods to their disciples in a spiritual lineage that extends to the present day. As a result, the Dutanga Gammatana mode of practice gradually spread throughout the country, along with Atsariyaman's exalted reputation. This nationwide acclaim began to escalate during the last years of his life, and continued to grow after his death until he came to be considered a national saint by almost unanimous consent. In recent decades, he has gained recognition beyond the confines of his native land as one of the 20th century's truly great religious figures. Atsariyaman's life epitomized the Buddhist ideal of the wandering monk, intent on renunciation and solitude, walking alone through forests and mountains, in search of secluded places that offer body and mind a calm, quiet environment in which to practice meditation for the purpose of transcending all suffering. His was a life lived entirely out of doors, at the mercy of the elements and the vagaries of weather. In such an environment, a Tutanga monk developed a deep appreciation of nature. His daily life was full of forests and mountains, rivers and streams, caves, overhanging cliffs, wild creatures, large and small. He moved from place to place by hiking along lonely wilderness trails in remote frontier regions, where the population was sparse and village communities far apart. Since his livelihood depended on the alms food he collected from those small settlements, a Tutanga monk never knew where his next meal would come from, or whether he would get any food at all. Despite the hardships and the uncertainties, the forest was a home to the wandering monk. It was his school, his training ground, and his sanctuary, and life there was safe, provided that he remained vigilant and faithful to the principles of the Buddha's teaching, living and practicing in the relatively uncultivated, undomesticated rural backwater that comprised most of Thailand at the turn of the 20th century. A Dudunga monk like Atsariya Mun found himself wandering through a centuries-old setting, little changed from the time of the Buddha 2,500 years ago. It is helpful to understand the temporal and cultural background to Atsariyaman's wandering lifestyle. Thailand in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was a loose confederation of principalities that were largely inaccessible to the central authority because most of the land was densely forested and paved roads were almost non-existent. During that period, 80% of Thailand's landmass was blanketed with pristine forests of mostly deciduous hardwoods and thick subtropical undergrowth. The lives of people in the hinterland areas were sustained by subsistence farming and the hunting of wild animals. Teeming with tigers and elephants, the vast forests were seen as being dangerous and frightening places, so the inhabitants banded together in village communities for the safety and companionship they provided. In the more remote frontier regions, such settlements were often a day's walk from one another, following trails that made their way through uninterrupted woodland. Forests and the rhythms of nature were defining features of the folklore and culture of those hardy people. To the villagers living together in isolated communities, the vast tracts of wilderness were forbidding, inhospitable territory, where wild animals roamed freely and malevolent spirits were said to hold sway. The huge Bengal tigers indigenous to that part of the world were especially fearsome. Such creatures ruled not only the forests, but the fears and fantasies of local people and monks alike popular fear of those impenetrable forest areas turned them into places of isolation and solitude where no one dared to venture alone. It was in this remote wilderness environment that Atariyaman and his Dutanga monks lived and wandered, practicing the ascetic way of life. Their meditation practice and the mental fortitude it instilled in them were their only defense against the hardships and potential dangers they faced every day. Forests and mountains were proven training grounds for such monks, who saw themselves as spiritual warriors battling their own mental defilements for the sake of ultimate victory. The story of Atsariyaman's life is a vivid portrait of a consummate spiritual warrior unrivaled in modern times, 
who practiced the Buddha's path to freedom with such perfection that he left those who knew and revered him in no doubt that he truly was a noble disciple. A beautiful story from beginning to end, his life is reminiscent of those famed accounts of the Buddha's great disciples chronicled in the ancient texts. Like theirs, his life shows us that the spiritual ideals taught by the Buddha are achieved by real human beings struggling against the same fundamental hindrances that we find within ourselves. Thus we are made to feel that the Buddha's ancient path to spiritual liberation is as wholly relevant today as it was 2,500 years ago. To this end, this biography of Atariyaman is less concerned with the precise account of events as they unfolded in Atariyaman's life and career than it is with providing a source of inspiration and edification for those devoted to Buddhist ideals. The author's perspective is that of an affirmative witness, an advocate, rather than an impartial observer chronicling events. Being a spiritual biography, it is intended to give us an insight into a model spiritual life. As such, this book should be viewed above all as an exercise in contemplation. One aspect of Atariyaman's teaching career deserves special mention, as it surfaces time and again in the course of his biography. Atariyaman possessed a unique ability to communicate directly with non-human beings from many different realms of existence. He was continually in contact with beings in the higher and lower celestial realms, spirits of the terrestrial realms, nagas, yakkas, ghosts of many sorts, and even the denizens of the hell realms, all of whom are invisible to the human eye and inaudible to the human ear, but clearly known by the inner psychic faculties of divine sight and divine hearing. The comprehensive worldview underlying Buddhist cosmology differs significantly from the view of the gross physical universe presented to us by contemporary science. In the traditional Buddhist worldview, the universe is inhabited not only by the gross physical beings that comprise the human and animal worlds, but also by various classes of non-physical divine beings called devas that exist in a hierarchy of increasing subtlety and refinement, and by numerous classes of lower beings living in the subhuman realms of existence. Only the human and animal worlds are discernible to normal human sense faculties. The others dwell in a spiritual dimension that exists outside the range of human concepts of space and time, and therefore beyond the sphere of the material universe as we perceive it. It was Altsariyaman's remarkable, inherent capacity for communicating with many classes of living beings that made him a teacher of truly universal significance. Knowing that living beings throughout the sentient universe share a common heritage of repeated existence and a common desire to avoid suffering and gain happiness, a great teacher realizes their common need to understand the way of Tamma in order to fulfill their spiritual potential and attain enduring happiness. Having the eye of wisdom, he made no fundamental distinction between the hearts of people and the hearts of devas, but tailored his teaching to fit their specific circumstances and levels of understanding. Although the message was essentially the same, the medium of communication was different. He communicated with human beings through the medium of verbal expression, while he used non-verbal, telepathic communication with all classes of non-human beings. To appreciate Atariyaman's extraordinary abilities, we must be prepared to accept that the world we perceive through our senses constitutes only a small portion of experiential reality, that there exists this spiritual universe of devas and brahmas which is beyond the range of our limited sense faculties. For in truth, the universe of the wise is much more vast than the one perceived by the average person. The wise can know and understand dimensions of reality that others do not even suspect exist and their knowledge of the principles underlying all existence gives them an insight into the phenomenal world that defies conventional limits. Atsariya Man's finely tuned powers of perception contacted an immense variety of external phenomena, and in the best Buddhist tradition he spent a considerable amount of time and energy engaged in teaching them Tamma. Such beings were as much a part of his personal world experience as the wild animals in the forest and the monks he trained so tirelessly. By virtue of his unparalleled expertise in these matters, he always felt a special obligation toward their spiritual welfare. Such phenomena are what Atsariyaman called mysteries of the heart, for they are conscious living beings dwelling in spiritual dimensions that are just as real as the one we inhabit, even though those spheres lie outside the realm of human existential concepts. The words heart and mind are used interchangeably in Thai vernacular. 
Heart is often the preferred term, as mind tends to exclude the emotional and spiritual dimensions associated with the heart. The heart is the essential knowing nature that forms the basic foundation of the entire sentient universe. It is the fundamental awareness underlying all conscious existence, and the very basis of all mental and emotional processes. The heart forms the core within the bodies of all living beings. It is the center, the substance, the primary essence within the body. Constantly emphasizing its paramount significance, Atsariyaman always claimed that the heart is the most important thing in the world. For this reason, the story of Atsariyaman's life and teachings is a story of the heart's struggle for spiritual transcendence and a revelation of the ineffable mystery of the heart's pure essence. The Bali term chitta is a word that Atsariyaman often used when referring to this essential knowing nature, commonly known as heart and mind. Like so many words in the Buddhist lexicon, it is essentially a technical term used specifically in the science of Buddhist theory and practice. Since such terms represent salient aspects of the subject matter of this book, some of them have been kept in their original form. Generally, in cases where a suitably accurate English translation exists, that word has been substituted, with the Bali term in question being annotated in an explanatory note. There are, however, certain terms for which Due to the complex and comprehensive nature of the truths they represent, no truly adequate English word exists. Those specialized terms have largely been left in the original Bali. They may be found explained in the notes and glossary sections at the back of the book, and the reader is encouraged to take full advantage of these reference materials.